thanks to thanks joy for organizing this uh, and thanks for all the turnout uh, there's a lot of people is interested in this topic and you guys are very diverse as uh, students have tech lead have data analysts I think uh, in this today's topic is very uh, exciting field that we should all get our hands on it and get get a feel on how this can help your work especially uh, for engineer and engineer we, we of course we, we like coding and we, we want to have machine learning to help us solve problems uh, but for the data analyst, analyst and uh, the manager and uh, even the, the technical lead, I think being able to understand data, being able to analyze it, help you to make decision, decision those are very good, uh, very essential skills as well. So uh, let's get started. Uh, yeah, so today I'm gonna go through some best, practice, best practices in ML. Uh, I'm gonna go, uh, have a running project like a uh, sign language detector, how to illustrate all these practices. So let's get started. So in this session, you, we will learn best practice, uh, how to pick a metrics, uh, how to pick approach if you are the lead of a project and how, how to use your data. So the recurring example of this talk is of course a sign, sign language detector so why is uh, machine learning important here? I think uh, this for this project is quite easy for us for us to see because looking at this picture, if I'm a coder, uh, I can not really use some rule to, to say uh, if this pixel is a white pixel, I, I would decide this is this is a this is a zero or using all kinds of if else to to be able to code this. This is uh, something that will need uh, understanding of this picture and being able to recognize pattern, just like our brain human does. We can recognize the pattern and uh, machine learning is doing this, doing this for us. It will need data to train it. That's uh, the training part. So th this is important for this project. But what about other projects that's not about picture or vision, like decision making, like some of you are working on ads, marketing, those are not, not working on, those are not decided or by a picture, right? Like if uh, a lot of them decided on whether a user is uh, in each, uh, what age group, whether the topic is interested in the to the user. So those, those kinds of things. Uh, for those, machine learning is also important because for the more and more data coming in into, into your website, we are in the online world. You need uh, machine learning to under, understand, those, uh, understand those patterns to help you make decisions. Oh, let's go. So I would like to just go over some, just go over some terminology of, so that uh, everyone can be on the same page. Machine learning, I think uh, these are the, the, the terms that we will meet in the first course of machine learning, like binary classification, multi-class classification, uh, ranking, perform a task like uh, drive, a regression, or clustering. So I was, uh, what about our, our problem? What is our, our what, what, oh, I couldn't go back. Is it because, uh, okay. What about our problem? What problem is it? For us, it's definitely, definitely a classification. For each sign, we want to be able to determine uh, a, a word or an a word in, in the language, so it's a classification. But uh, is it binary? No, it's not binary, right? There's a lot of, lot of, a uh, lot of outcome. So it's a uh, this one is a multi-class classification. Okay, we see you now. Okay. So uh, nowadays, uh, of course, uh, pre previously we we are, we know that some problems is supervised. Some problem is some, some data is unsupervised. Supervised means the data has a label saying, telling us uh, when we're doing training, we will label the data is, is it a one, is it a zero? So we'll write it down to train our algorithm. Unsupervised is when the data, when we got the data to train, we don't, we don't have a label on each example. 
So those are unsupervised. And these are these are also the, the terms in machine learning. Uh, I won't go I won't go over them uh, one by one, but uh, some popular one is the label I just used. Label means uh, when we have a training day training example, we label it that this is the result we want to predict. Uh, whether it is true or false, uh, saying maybe is is the patient has has a, a disease, or in my case, the label is what word is this picture, this sign language is trying to trying to represent. Features, uh, features are your training data is different, uh, different, different value for, to help your machine learning algorithm to learn the, this label. So for our example, the features for us is actually the pixel of the pictures, right? And for other machine learning, it could be uh, users' attributes, their age, their 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 incomes, etc. The rest I will go uh, go over it when they come up in the later example. Okay. So, yeah, in our example, uh, the picture. The picture of a hand is the, our instance. The label is a two, uh, one or two, one, two, or, or some word. And we want to represent it as a, a, as a vector, right? So when, when, so, when the two is, a, is true, we put a one there. When the others are not true, uh, we, we, don't, we only predict one of them is true. So this vector could be a very long vector to, to represent your dictionary. Uh, vocab vocabulary of this sign language. So when when you do a hand sign, uh, we we take this hand sign picture and predict which one is a one. So that's our output. Oh, so features is the all the pixels on on the image. So usually, uh, thirty two by thirty two is the long the 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 height and width of a picture. What is this three? This three is actually the three color channels of each each image. Each image has three color channels, like red, green, and blue. So there's when we when we see one picture, it's actually three pictures stacked together. Mm -hmm. So to 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 give us this color, right? Uh, and then model later on, we will come up with a lot model on how to predict this. But uh, some example could be random forest trained on data uh, metric. Uh, could be accuracy, of course. We want to be able to predict as accurate. Uh, we want to predict correctly, as most uh, as 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 much correct example as possible. Pipeline. Uh, let's explain later. So uh, tr let's talk about the uh, the data, different uh, the methodology about about machine learning. Usually, uh, when we have some data on hands. We want to we want to divide this data for different purpose. Uh, why why do we want to divide it? Well, of course, we if we took all, all of these, uh, let's say uh, I have a uh, hundred pictures, I use all of them all all hundred of them to 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 train my algorithm. Uh, there's not nothing else I I can I can use it to to validate my my performance. So usually when you do a to a machine learning, you collect tons of data. You want to set aside some data to do validation and do testing. So there's some science of behind how to divide this, but there's some rules to follow. One is, of course, don't overlap it. Make sure when you do training, those data is only for training. Don't use uh, the training data to for, to validate because. You you train your algorithm towards uh towards this training data. If you you're gonna perform well on these training data, but you want your algorithm to perform well on data that it hasn't seen before in the real world, where some some new pictures coming in, how will your model perform? So that's why you want to set a size of data that don't use it for training. No overlap, and validation and test set needs to be real, of course. We want we wanted to represent the real data that we want to perform well in the real world. 
and make sure they come from the same distribution. Ah, that this one is quite. This one is actually quite a, hard to understand why, but let me explain. It's not that hard. Right. Uh, for the test data and validation, validation is like uh, when you you are if you are an archer, you, your algorithm is is an archer. You are helping you you're training it to aim towards a, a goal. You want to hit the arrow at the center of the goal. So validation is validation set is where you set this goal to make your algorithm to shoot for the center. So if your validation set and the test set are totally different, they they are. They're not in the same distribution. They don't represent the same problem. Like if my if I train my sign detector or on all the picture using hand using hand sign, and then on the test set is not hand sign anymore. Maybe using some uh, using some 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 pen or some other object to 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 make a sign. Your model is not going to perform well. What's the problem here? The problem is you are not training your data towards your real goal. So make sure your, your data validation set is matched to your real goal. So if your real goal is one to predict on hand sign, train it on hand, collect data and train it and validate it on hand sign. So that's, uh, that's what I said. And no decision based on test set. Uh, test set is you, you want to be able to predict how your model perform on data that it hasn't seen before, never seen before. Like uh, when you go on, when you go to production, it go in the real world, it will meet pictures that it never seen before. So you, you don't want to, you want to set up, set aside this test set. You only wanted to use it to measure how well your model perform in the real world. So that's what is it. So this is a little flow diagram on how a project, how our algorithm usually do, usually perform the life cycle of it. So we have training examples. We use it to train a model. Once we have to model, remember we have a validation example. We use, that's not used for training, but we use it to perform some predictions. And we will see how well it performs on some data that it hasn't trained on before, right? It was like, for example, accuracy. What's the accuracy right now? So we can see that if the, something is not up to standard, something is not as expected, we can iterate on the model, decide on, uh, do I need some other new features? Do I need to make the architecture more complex? And sometimes we might need to collect more data. That's uh, that could fix the problem. So this this little circuit here will go through multiple times until we find a model that we think is performing well on this validation examples. Yeah, it is, and we make a decision on the model. We pick the best we can find, and then we want to see how it how it works on data that it hasn't seen before. That's the test examples come in. We never used this before. So we use it to predict, use it for prediction uh, and see, uh, we'll see a test metric that represents how well our, our, our model will work on the real world when we see data that it never, never trained on or validated on before. And once your model goes to production, you will keep predicting on real world data. Maybe for my project, if I build a camera using my algorithm, my camera could be set on a door, or maybe I sit on a room and someone will come in and do a hand gesture and I will predict what sign language is it and try to record it, record is, uh, what, what they're trying to say. Oh. So when in production, make sure uh, we the, our model is not finished yet, right? Uh, when, when we deploy to production, why is that is not finished? What what else can be changed? Well, what can be changed is your data could be changing. 
because your, your, your application sit in the in the real world, maybe in an app, maybe in a camera. In my case, in a room, but the data could be shifting. Maybe your user is growing up; is no longer a teenager. Maybe maybe your app is now used by some other demographic in some new use cases that you hasn't expected before. So what you trained on before is no longer fresh, no longer current to your new production production data. Make sure you monitor this drift of performance. If your performance is starting to decay, that's when you, you might need to collect new data and do new training to iterate again. So that's what it said. Evaluate metric. So this one uh, could, it, it looks a little bit, uh, little bit complex on a lot of, lot of, uh, lot of equations. But this one is more, uh, I think, in, in the in the university, we usually uh, let's say uh, predict the uh, ground ground truth. Say say a patient, right? If a patient has a disease, it's true. Uh, if it, if they doesn't, it's a false. And our algorithm will predict whether they have a disease, true and false. Hold on a second. Let me bring my thing to a cursor. Okay, that will be easier for you to see my cursor. So I will predict prediction can be true and false. And this is a con called confusion matrix. We will divide it when something true, that's true positive, when, and when we predict it true. That means uh, when someone has a disease, and our algorithm predicted true, true, correctly. And the others are is the others are is using the same rule to to divide them. So there's a, use some common metrics. Right? Accuracy, accuracy means uh, out of all of these predictions we did, which one we did it correctly. We did correctly on the true positive and true negative. So true positive, true negative, divided by the whole, the all four boxes. So that's that crazy. Precision and recall. Precision is when we do prediction, we predict true. How many of them did we predict it correctly? So it's on this row, first row. Recall is when some patient is indeed have this disease, how much did we predict, how much did we find out so on this column? All right. Uh, there's a lot. There's also a, a very common metric called F1 score. F1 score. I will explain why this has come up. So right uh, later, maybe maybe later. Uh, the other is area under the rock curve. This is a rock curve. You can see it on the on the y-axis is the recall. On the x-axis is the false positive rate. Uh, so we want to have as much as recall as possible, the larger the recall as possible, and as little as false positive as possible. So we want to shoot for this corner, actually. We want to shoot for this corner. So if our curve is, one curve is like this, the other curve is higher up like this, the second second model will be better. That's why the area under curve uh, measure this. The more the area under this curve, the better your your model. So that's another metric. So choose metric. Uh, so make sure uh, some sometimes uh, we we got very we want our product to be perfect. We could choose a, a lot of metrics, but that's not a very efficient way, because uh, as you are a startup startup, you want to iterate on your model as fast as possible. Pick a single metric metric that will help you to optimize, help you to iterate faster. But what if well, I do have multiple metrics that I care about? Try to combine it. Uh, F1 score, uh, like I mentioned, is actually the F1 score is the average of precision and recall. Precision, uh, I think precision is this, this row, recall is this column, so it's the average between them. Well, uh, one strange thing is why is F1 score don't care about true negative, right? Why it got it got excluded? True negative means uh, 
back to the, the, the patient example. If it's a rare disease like cancer, uh, it's not gonna have a lot of people with cancer. So this, this false is gonna be fake. A lot of people here. And true negative means your algorithm correctly predicts someone doesn't have a cancer. Uh, it, it's going to be a very large number. It's going to skew your your performance. You want to ignore your because your 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 algorithm doesn't care. Uh, you, you you want your algorithm to be able to predict people that has disease truly has disease. So F one's goal is trying to ignore this this part. Weight metrics from different demo, dem, demographics. That one is also also. Uh, very common, common use. Sometimes your metrics is not uniform. You you care about more more cases than others. Like some demographics is more important to your business. You give it a higher weight. So that's what I say. Define a constraint. You can define some constraints even though you pick a single metric. Say I want to maximize the recall, but. Uh, I want to measure my recall, but I want to make sure my precision is larger than 0 0.95. Another one is maximize my area under curve, uh, but make sure the running time when we do prediction, make sure the running time doesn't take too long, like uh, one second. That could be another one. Hmm. So for me, this project uh, is quite, this class is doesn't have that much complexity in the business. Uh, I can pick uh, accuracy as my metric, uh, but I do have some constraints. I don't, uh, when I do the prediction, I don't want my model because I, I, want, I want it to be, be useful in a camera setting. So uh, I want to be able to predict a sign in less than five seconds. That's a constraint. So this is what, uh, basically what I, what I picked. So now back to, uh, I would like to uh, help, I would like to il illustrate how do you do a project. Imagine you are a CEO of a sign language detection camera project. You can, you, you so, so for this uh, project, we, we just focus on the algorithm. We don't, we don't focus on the hardware of the camera and what will you lead your team to do first? You can be, so imagine you are a startup that's working on this project. Your first decision, uh, how do you start this project? Is it about coming up with model? Coming up, uh, is it about coming up, with, uh, coming up with data? So let's find out. So uh, for the pre for the audience, uh, please uh, I'll give I'll give maybe five minutes to input your input your answer, and when we come back, we will we will discuss together. Okay, so uh, for those of you who are not familiar, you can go to menti.com on your browser, right, and then just see in the uh, seven numbers in, and then you can you can answer a question. Yeah. Uh, don't have a prize for you lah, but do participate into <laughs> do participate in the in the discussion. Yeah, it would be great if you have the you have the prize. <laughs> Join next time must prepare prize ah. <laughs> Okay, uh, so I'll give you guys some time. So meanwhile, meanwhile, while we wait, we are, while we're populating this right. Uh, Tom T, maybe can you can you answer one or two questions then? Sure. Yeah. Um, so there's uh, okay. So one of them is asking usually when we need to check the ML uh, model drift. Ah, uh, usually uh make usually we would uh we would want to be able to do it reg uh continuously. That means we want in when our model in the wild we want to be able to log some data about it. We want to be able to monitor so mm -hmm. it's a regular uh continuous continuous monitor process so it's it's not that okay. we decide on when how, how many how many days we, we do it okay yeah. okay uh 
so I think that's uh, Bunyong is asking, uh, how does it work? Is it sign language in a sequence, right? So I think you mentioned already just now, right? It's a camera setting where mm. the camera will be looking at the different signs and then have to mm. sort of make the prediction within the half second, right? Is that correct? Yeah, within okay. half seconds. Yeah. So it could. So uh, let's simplify it for this for now. Let's say uh, your, your training will just be taking one picture and be able to predict the 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 sign the single 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 word it, it represents in 0.5 seconds. Okay, so that means when, when you're doing the training, it's all static uh, images, yeah. uh, pictures of all the different different signs and all. Yeah. Right. But once you when you implement it, it will be actually through a camera, uh, yeah. video. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So uh, it's the word, is it? Sorry, Bonyong. So like uh, some sign language is uh, one, maybe two, two sequences is uh, sort by a word, or maybe three sequence is a sentence. Uh, it, it doesn't work that way. Like, it's uh, basically just using sign language to form uh, words, like A, B, C, D, like that, is it? Oh. oh. You, uh, so I think it's the sign language like trying to create the words, or or is it the, the type where they can actually communicate? Uh, uh, I think a uh, sign language usually uh, uh, every every different sign will represent a word, and then you, you put them together, and and they, they will form a. Oh, so not not that type where where like maybe uh like a peace sign, it's a lot, it's a piece or something. Yeah, oh, something like that. Yeah. Moving one shoulder from the other is a, sign, a, a, a certain word like that. No, not that type. Well, not that type. I guess uh, some. Wow. Yeah. That wouldn't it, like be a very long. Oh, like, sorry, sorry. To... I think uh, uh, usually uh, it's, they, the, the sign language is trying to be as, as efficient as possible, right? Uh, they, yeah, they, yeah, you yeah, don't so want to do it in a little character. You want to be represent an object. Uh, several words, maybe some some meanings, in inter in inter sign. Mm. So like I think that's what like, Bojong is mentioning, lah. Yeah. So it's not like creating sen sentences like A B C D E, right? Is uh, or no, is no. it detecting A B C D E or, or no no is it like no, no, trying? No. It's not A B C D E. It could be a uh, apple or orange. Oh, but but sign language only there's a sequence, right? Like maybe maybe three sequence is one word like that. So, but but this one is just one picture, one word like that, is it? Yeah, one picture, one word. Yes. Yeah. Oh, okay. Uh, well, I would I like to say is uh, for for this presentation, uh, because uh, it's just to illustrate the best practices. Uh, I'm I'm trying to make a project that simplifies things for us to illustrate the the key points. Oh, sorry. Okay, good job. The oh, question. Okay, uh, ah, okay. Uh, uh, one word by one word. Yeah. Yes, yeah, so one 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 word by one word. Uh, depends. So, so because it's if you look at the training data, it's actually one image at a time. All right. So yeah. So it'll oh. be one. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so yeah, I think I think Zhang Qi also understand that's that's limitation to it uh, But I think this is a project that that just sort of like starting out. So that's why. Uh, I thought also something that is quite interesting to share with the uh, with the community. Yeah. Yeah. Ah. But we, yeah, let's see, let's build on top of this and see if we can improve. Yeah, exactly. Uh, okay, let's do one more question. Then we we'll go back to the Mentimeter. Then, uh, how to evaluate multi-label, uh, models? Ah. Uh? Hmm. Uh, yeah, Zhang Xi, I think. We take this and we we'll go back to the multimeter. Then, how how to evaluate the multi-label model? Multi-label is it like a multi-class class multi-class multi classification? I think it should be multi-class. Yes, it should be multi-class. Okay, multi-class classification. So, in this case, uh, we'll pick a we'll pick a we'll evaluate uh, the the metric uh, we pick is uh, definitely accuracy. Mm. Right. We want to make sure the the sign do do this. We predict we predict a one. Uh, if we predict something anything else, or the or any other labels, that would be a, a wrong prediction for us. 
Hmm. So we just count how much how much we predict correctly out of out of all the other predictions. That's uh, the accuracy. Okay. It, it should be accuracy la, to, I think to Daryl's uh, question, how to evaluate multi-label model, it should be accuracy. Uh, so as long as what is predicted is equal to the actual label, then that is considered accurate idea, right? Anything else will be considered as uh, yeah. false. La. Yeah. Mm, okay. All right. Uh, okay, Cam, let's, let's go back to the uh, Mentimeter then. Yeah. Okay. You can continue, Zhang Qi. Thanks. Thanks. So we have a lot of, a lot of, a lot of answer. Let me get some time to take a look. Mm -hmm. To find a problem, collect data, explore possible data types. Okay. Write up use cases and business values. Mm -hmm. That's pretty good. So yeah, because you are the CEO, you want to make sure you know what how uh, when you know what to aim towards. You want to know the business values of your 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 model. That's correct. That's definitely a good a good uh, discussion to have with your team. Amass data, yeah. Create data collections and annotate them. Yeah. Dictionary and hand sign. Yeah, that, a lot of them are at, uh, is about data. Yeah, uh, I would like to be able to. I would like to give you some some uh, some tips. So when 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 we do when we start a project, uh, make sure the of course uh, we want to, we want to know what what the success of this project look like, and also we we will now we will want to be do some research on existing work, right. Uh, the problem you're solving some, sometimes is already already tackled by some other other team or maybe in some literature, some papers, maybe some open source solutions. So do search for that. Search for that before you start. Uh, search for that and make that as as uh, your to do list to 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 understand those. And the second part is definitely uh, uh, about uh, the data. Uh, I before that I also want you to maybe take take a take a little step to visualize what the input and output of your algorithm look like. So for for us, uh, we want to some already we have some discussion. What is the input? Is it an image? Is it a sequence of words? Uh, sequence of sequence of video? How many seconds? So those are your input. So make sure to visualize what 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 those look like. And that will help you later on. Uh, that will help you to collect the data you want. You don't want to collect all the images when later on think you you decided uh, you don't you don't need images. You actually need something else. So that that part needs to have a discussion with your team. Yeah. So let's get back to work. Um, so. A lot of you are talking about collecting data, right? So we we have some discussion. Uh, make sure to visualize what your data look like. But when you one thing is when you start spending time to collect the data, uh, how long do you spend your time on? Should you collect as much data as possible so that your algorithm can train on as much as data as possible? Definitely not. Right? You don't you don't want to start a uh, spend a whole whole month collecting data and later on decided the data is useless. So when you start starting up, collect some data uh, to be able to get your, get your algorithm to, to train your first version of algorithm. And also uh, have a process of once you get the data you, you collect it, uh, try to Try to explore these data. Try to have a uh, use a tool to take a look at these data, visualize their distribution. Later on, I will show you. I will show you that some tools on on doing that. And uh, also nowadays we have a lot of ways of collecting data. In my examples, uh, I can go online and download some picture of a hand sign, right? Uh, in other in other other problems, maybe it, it might be not as not as practical or feasible to collect the data online. Uh, you might need to go uh, collect this data yourself. 
you might need to go uh, go to Amazon, the mechanical term, to, to hire people to generate these data. But uh, for the, the advice still stands the same. Make sure you collect these data as fast as possible so that you have uh, you have your first version. Uh, sorry guys, I have uh, I have uh, someone knocking on my door. Give me two uh, give me two seconds. I'll be back. Uh, this one you are asking whether uh, there will be a, a video link and all this. Uh, I will check with uh, Engineer SG, but should be should be Engineer SG's uh, YouTube channel. Uh, then uh, I will will post a link in the uh, Facebook page. Yeah, so just look out for the video. Uh. Oh yeah, thanks, Michael. So maybe, maybe Mike, Michael, you can share the link with me then, or maybe just go over to our Facebook page and share it as well. Yeah. Oh, well, we wait for uh Zhang Qi. Paul, are you still there? <laughs> Hello. So sorry. So hey, no worries. Come. Right. <laughs> so yeah. Uh, yes. Same. That's uh, later on. I will show you some tools to explore your data. So when you collected the data, don't just uh, trust it. Make sure to look at the data. See if the label. See see if everything is uh, what you need. Yeah. This is uh, exploring the data. Okay, so explore the data. Uh, there's I want to I want to show you one tool today is the what if tool. Uh, this tool is helping you to visualize the data without uh, writing as little code as possible. Uh, it might not be very easy to to for for new for new machine learning people, but uh, that's why uh, I want to show you to so get you get you a little bit a taste of this tool. But uh, when you're starting when you're starting your first when you when you're still getting getting around Python or no uh, Jupyter notebook, you don't you 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 don't want to you don't want to worry about this yet. But later on, when you are working with data quite a bit, you want to have some way to, to explore this data and writing as little code as possible. So let me show you. The interface is, uh, this one is the, an example is classifying the predicting the, predict, uh, the salary of some, some, some people based on their, their features. So let's see, uh, the features include age, uh, education, Hours per week, marital marital status, and uh, their race and relationship and sex. So in this uh, this demonstration, I think it has two two model competing, model one and model two. So right now we are looking at the label of model one. The I think the the the, the blue is we predict the income is less than fifty k. The red one we predict. Uh, more than 50k so you can change you can look at what model 2 is will pre be predicting you can see the difference and you will be able this one is the the best one i think you don't need to even come up with model and you can start looking at the distribution of different features like age capital gain uh, this one is the the label you want to predict uh, but already we see some problem in this one, right? Remember, uh, this is our label with the target we want to predict. 
but it's very skilled. A lot of people is, lots of people is zero means, zero means uh, we, uh, lots of people is under 50K, only a few people is over 50K. So when we're picking a metric, if we only pick accuracy, like in my hand sign prediction, uh, sign prediction project, it's not gonna be fitting for this project because uh, an algorithm can predict everyone, everyone to be less than, uh, earning less than 50K and they, the algorithm, the model will be, have a very high accuracy already. So we want, for this kind of data, you might want to be, uh, to handle this skewed, skewed distribution and or pick a different metric. Uh, yeah, a lot of distribution and this, this one is also very interesting. Let's see. Uh, this page. Uh, slice by, let's say I want to slice by sex. So slice by sex, it will have two, a male and female here. Female here. Well, what do we want to see here? So we want to see, we divide our data into male and female, and we see the two models trying to predict them. Uh, some predict, uh, so a threshold is 0.5. So when we, both of them is 0.5. When one model, uh, one, one, when, when, we, when the score is higher than 0.5, we predict uh, it has a, we predict them has a, has a what? Has a, has over 50K, right? So if in here, when we drag this, we can see the predicted number changing. So let's explore one thing. I want very interesting. This is male uh, male income versus female income, right? Uh, if we want the we want our algorithm to be fair to both male and female, we predict actual let's say this number. We predict two hundred and eighty-eight percent, eighty-eight percent. When we when we have a threshold like this, we predict eighty-eight percent. Uh, 88% that's uh, predict no. And we, if we want to match that for a female, right, that right now is 90 something, 90 something. We actually want to, we well, need to drop this, 80, drop it to 80 something, to, to be matching, matching the pr prediction number of these two algorithms. So you can see the threshold for for male and female is different. Uh, th this is a this is a very set truth. The, the data actually say, telling us that the our, our for for male uh, for the algorithm to predict to predict them to have a have a higher income is actually has a higher threshold than female. So that's what this graph is about. And uh, also, you can you can uh, mo the the most uh, in interesting thing is you can try to mo modify this data. Say switching their switching their hours per week or switching their education to see if your algorithm will pre will change your decision of your algorithm. So that's it. This tool is cool. uh, it, it it takes some yeah it, it's very interesting. It will take you some time to explore. So uh, later on, uh, when after the after the after this talk, uh, I hope you you will find some demo and take a look at play, play around with. Okay, the other one is TensorFlow Playground. This one uh, help you to help you to get familiar with TensorFlow's TensorFlow's players. So for us, uh, let's back, get back to our project. Once we get the data, our data is some, some pictures uh, of a hand. Maybe uh, I, I took it myself, maybe uh, in a room in some, in some good lighting, good lighting. And uh, we come up with the first model. For your first model, make sure, uh, like I said, make sure you, you want to be able to go full fast. You don't want to spend a lot of time building your first model and then 
and I found out it's not performing well. We want to be able to move fast, collect data fast, build your first model fast, and iterate fast. Why is it so important to move fast to, on these uh, simplest, on, on these first few steps? Well, think about it this way. Uh, when you move fast on your first model, move fast on collecting data, you are not just uh, maybe saving you a few days. It's actually, uh, think of, treat it like helping you to move two times faster, right? When, when your project moves two times faster, when on everything you do, you are you you are very competitive in the market. If you're a startup or in in your in your job as well, you know, versus other competitor. So first model, I only I do a both basic thing for image, uh, just for neurons. Just this is one layer, and uh, output. For for me uh, here, I only draw two outputs. But the output is equals to the number of words in your vocabulary of my of my sign detection. So this is the simplest thing I come up with. Uh, for other project like uh, classification of of this, uh, whether whether income over fifty k, it can even be simpler. Even the logistic regression could be worth as your, uh, could could work as your first model. It could perform quite well already. You have a baseline already. So one fully collected layer. That's my. Thing. So uh, once you have this model, right? Once you have this model and you start training it and you start validating it, you will you will see the performance. Here on the left is uh, is a learning curve. Learning curve uh, is plotting the error of my algorithm. The bottom one is the training data. The top curve is the the validation validation data. And uh, on the bottom is the number, uh, the size of my training set. So why does the curve look like this? Yeah, imagine when my training when my training is just one example, just one picture. My algorithm is very likely to be able to remember remember this uh, remember this uh, picture and do a prediction. So the error for this training, after training uh, is very low, but it's not gonna perform well on data it hasn't seen before, like uh, our, like my validation set. It's only when my data, my data is increasing, um, it's harder and harder to model all these different pictures, different kinds of hand sign, different kinds of lighting. So the error could, on my training set, uh, I will start seeing it go up because it's harder to represent all of them. But because it gains all these all these uh, training, my model is having a, being able to represent more and more complex function. On data that it hasn't seen before, it, the error will drop. If it, so it, the curve we will usually meet at some point. That's what this graph is trying to say. But this graph is actually uh, not uh, telling us a problem of my model. It is telling me that after some training, I have a big gap between my uh, the the error on my train training training set and the error of my uh, validation set. How do I how do I solve this? This is telling me telling me a telling me a thing telling me a thing that uh, my training set has high variance. Uh, high variance basically means uh, my algorithm is able to have a low training error. It can represent very well of my training set. It maybe it remembers everything. Maybe it, uh, it fits them very well. But on data that it hasn't seen before, it doesn't, doesn't work that good. In that case means I don't have enough data actually. I could, I should go out and collect more data or uh, some other techniques like uh, for hand sign, I could augment the, uh, for pictures, I can augment the picture. Usually augmenting, augmenting big picture means uh, cropping them on different spots. And your hands could be on different region of the picture, different region of your, your picture. Uh, so that's augmentation. But uh, make sure one one thing I want to make sure is uh, when you do augmentation, the sign sign language sometimes the sign on left and right 
the, the sign language is different. So when we do augmentation, we, we don't, don't flip the picture, maybe top and up and down is meaning totally different words. So be careful of that. So we, we use this kinds of, use this kinds of metric, uh, learning curve error, or, or the, the metric, the accuracy metric, or the rock curve to feedback, as a feedback to improve on our model. Our, mo our first model, actually, one, one layer of model is not very complex. So it couldn't quite represent our data. So the second model, it, we come up with is more complex. We try to have more layers now, a lot more layers. Uh, this, I, uh, this one con convolution, that convolution layers. Uh, if it, if you are interested, uh, we can discuss later. But this one works for image, but for other problems, you might have a uh, simpler layers like a fully collected layer. And we stack them together at this times two. The more layer you have, the more complex your model is. It is able to model some complex things like can sign. And in our case, this one is actually some people previously asked, what is uh, how do you do with multi multi labeling? Right, softmax is multi labeling. It will output a vector of probability. The highest probability uh, vector of probability one, two, three on different positions. The highest probability is the one we predict. Say the say the fourth elements, we have a 0.9 probability. That means we predict this 0.9 chances that this sign is a four. So that's what it is. So for this, uh, we did very good on training accuracy because our our model is more complex. It's now a 0.9 now. It, but it also improves on test accuracy as well. It's not as good as training, but uh, it got to 0.78. Yeah, this is more um, more complex model help us to increase the accuracy on, on the on data it hasn't seen before. But uh, still not very, not, this is a very high variance uh, problem. We, we, are able, we, we don't have a lot of, uh, we, we don't have a lot of error on training, but we have a lot of error on, on test. That means uh, we might need to be, we might, we might need to make, introduce some regularization into my model. It's too, too, too overfit to my data. And then uh, the next one we iterated on to introduce to introduce all the regularization. Uh, don't worry about about uh, all these details. These details very. Uh, see uh, very computer vision specific, but uh, I will point out that some layers that this batch normalization, uh, all, all of these has batch normalization in it that introduce, introduce regularization, make sure my model don't overfit the data that much. And this model is, you can see this uh, has a lot of layers in it. Each of these blocks has quite a bit of layers. And it, it helped me to help me to improve on the test accuracy a lot from 78 to 80.6. But since it, there's a, a lot of layers, the training takes a lot of time. I actually, actually training on, on CPU, uh, if I, on my computer, only CPU, and I need to train, train like, like uh, if I train it for 40. Oh, sorry, cool. What's the timing? Do I need to speed up? Another, another 10 minutes, then we can take the questions, yeah. Another 10 minutes to then take it. Okay, I think yeah. I, can, I can do it. Yeah, yeah the, tra the training actually need to do on the C uh, on the GP on GPU. On GPU, uh, I can train it fa much faster than CPU. And uh, on, but when we do prediction, training, we take a lot of time, but on do, when we do prediction, it doesn't take a lot of time. So it fits my criteria. So let's get, Get, uh, once you have your your model, you 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 want to test it. You want to launch it in production, so make sure you you just launch it on some fraction of user first and do some A/B testing. Right, this is a part where advertising companies usually do when they have a new algorithm on predicting ads, uh, ads click-through rate. That how 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 
what's how likely a user will click on the ad. So you 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 do A/B testing. So once you're in production, like I said, monitor the performance regularly, continuously. Uh, when you see some drift, yeah, regularly. Uh, when you see some drift, means uh, create some tasks for yourself to update your model, or collect the new data and iterate. So all of this, I I will let you know in in Facebook how how we do it. Uh, you don't have to worry too much uh, if you are a startup, right? When you're a startup, you can write your algorithm, uh, like we discussed, have have your algorithm, have some data to be able to run that. That's good enough. But uh, I would suggest you, when you're startup starting, invest investigate the tools around the ecosystem, like the data exploration tool I show you, that will help you speed up your, uh, help you give insights on the data. And for the infrastructure, also spend some time. To, to take a look look around the market because all of these help you iterate faster, help you to stay competitive in the market. Monitoring uh, is definitely one. Uh, be able to monitor the predict how how well your your algorithm predicting in the real world data. Make sure when the drift happen, you have a to do. So in Facebook, we do have this kinds of, of course, uh, in the scale of Facebook. We, we we need this infrastructure. We have so we have a, a whole pipeline to train a model. We all of these are a model. Each row is a model. So for for ML engineer, we can deploy a model, uh, multiple actually. We can deploy multiple model and pick the one that has best performance. So we don't have to wait on each one. Once the one we picked uh, is the good model, this one is actually a, a tree decision tree. Right? You can see. Uh, once we pick the right model, we can we can deploy it to real world, just uh, with just uh, within the same 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 pipeline. So this picture you see it before. This is a train. This is a test training validation picture I showed you before. In Facebook, we have uh, the infrastructure to try to map all of these into a same workflow, same application. I can show you. From the feature, from data to feature computation, uh, this part is data. Uh, sorry, data. What? Uh, what is the difference between data and feature? Data is a, uh, of course, is the data in the database. Features is is ready for to you for use in machine learning in our in our world. So uh, one say say uh, our database is already have all the all the pictures of hand uh, one of us could one of the employees could already generate it uh, some create, computed the features for these images the other the other employee that want to work on the same problem uh, he doesn't need to compute these features anymore he can share this look at he can we can have a tools everyone can share the features they computed they can use it together training uh, the previous slide show you the training screen evaluation and evaluation and inference is like evaluation is on training picking a real uh, good model inference is uh, when we deploy in the production we make predictions with it uh, so in this area because uh, this is uh, Facebook Facebook's infrastructure uh, but I would suggest uh, people not in Facebook investigate some time on a some other um, other tool tool set like PyTorch that's open source that they have a API to build this kind of pipeline. Uh, look at take a look at uh, uh, Snowflake and Amazon's uh, machine learning stack. So investigate some time on the tools that will benefit you later. So for us, the takeaway is make sure to explore the data when you collect it. Make sure to visualize what kind of data you need. Explore it. Uh, so, and also do some research. Do some search online. Look for an open source project that you can utilize to kickstart your project. Uh, choose a one metric to optimize towards so, and iterate quickly. And uh, lastly, monitor the performance. Keep the model current. Yeah, so that's that's it for uh, for this presentation. So I can take some.
question. Yeah, I do have a slide for, for, for people to answer questions, but you can put it in the chat as well. Okay, I think let's go with the chat first. Uh, so maybe uh, let's, let's do the next one that we may have missed out, and that is uh, uh, what are the tools that, that you use? I think that one we covered already just now. Uh, mm. Oh, yeah. actually, what tools are you using to check for data drift? I oh. think it should be model drift, like not, not, not data drift, but the model drift, yeah. What tools do we use uh, for data drift, right? Yeah. Uh, for, for performance drift. Mm -hmm. uh, we, well, uh, on, when, once we deploy, we monitor, we monitor the, the metric we care about, like accuracy in my project. Mm -hmm. uh, you, can, you can monitor other, you can decide on metric you want to monitor. Mm -hmm. Once that, uh, a good rule of thumb is once that, once that uh, value is starting to go down, starting to go down, that means your model is getting outdated. Mm -hmm. uh, the other thing is, uh, remember I showed you the, the tool that explore data? Uh, the what if tool? Yeah, the what if tool. Okay. So at the beginning, oh, at the beginning, you you are, if you are you know you're trading on data that's with this with this uh distribution on age, mm. and when later on when you monitor online, you you can also monitor you can also not only monitor the outputs of and metric, you also monitor the the data is 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 predicting on. You can also monitor the distribution. Say now your app is no longer no longer used by teams anymore. It's now using more more by uh, people in the 30 or 40. So that's a drift in, in your data, definitely a drift. So your model needs to be, needs to be updated. So yeah. That one is also, yeah. Okay. Okay, can, uh, David, I think your, your question is answered already. Is it a single algorithm or multiple? So it's just one single CNN uh, model. Uh, are there methods to automatically recalibrate the model using data collected from users? Okay, so so Francis over here asks, are there methods that you use right, to automatically uh, recalibrate the model uh, with the new data collected from the user? That means your model, oh. does, it, does your model actually have the ability to evolve over time or you have to sort of retrain rather? Oh, yeah, uh, I think, uh, the, about the retrain, right? This this part is a uh, is is definitely not hard. Uh, if you you can set up some automation to to mm -hmm. monitor the performance, give it a threshold, say uh, it drops sev several points, uh, one point accuracy already. Uh, you can automate this uh, retrain process. Uh, but uh, usually usually we would we would uh, this we would we would try to investigate a little bit instead of uh, instead of letting a system uh, uh, recalibrate itself. Mm. So that's up to, definitely up to the team. Okay. Can, yeah. Okay. Um, also, do you do any uh, foreground, foreground um, detection or back, background removal for no, your images? Uh, this part, uh, for, for this project, the, this project, no. Uh, because uh, the image is quite small uh, and we are quite we we are quite confident that the, the the neural network is more complex than than a, a thirty by thirty two pic, picture, but uh, you have you bring out a good point is uh, some pictures like very large picture very complex picture like object detection for self driving sometimes mm -hmm. for those kind of problems you you do, for me I can collect, I can I can take picture of my hands. Uh, thousands of times uh, in very short time, but for self-driving car, you you're not very likely to have a lot of picture on, on, from from cars that on, on different roads, right? Mm -hmm. uh, so that for th those kinds of problem, you don't have enough data. Make sure, so at that point at that time, you might divide your problem into several several phases. Like first detecting a, a car, detecting a, a phase, put a bounding box, remove everything. And then mm -hmm. the second second uh, second algorithm and network try to detect what this what this uh, bounding box is telling me. It's maybe a stop sign, maybe a car, something. Mm -hmm. so, but for me, uh, this doesn't need to. 
crop any pictures. Okay, so 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 you actually all your pictures you never crop or sort of like rotate or maybe uh how yeah. you do some do some changes. Oh yeah, because I have uh, enough data, I don't uh, I don't need to do the augmentation. But okay. if I don't have enough data, I I might need to start cropping it uh, to create create more testing data. I see. Okay. Can uh let's see more investigators. Uh. Okay, maybe we just take one more question uh, in, in view of time, uh, given the time that we have. Um, okay, I think Daryl asked this question and that is, uh, will more layers actually always result in overfitting? But based on your experience, does, does, that, does that really, is that the case? Nah. So uh, nowadays, especially the days we are in, definitely we have tons of data. Uh, we we have more data than, than we need sometimes in 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 the online and online company and in the connected world. Mm. So I, more and more, the the world right now is creating deeper and deeper layers. How do we mm. how do they combat this deep layer? Usually, deep layer means more complex. Uh, it can represent more complex thing. So you could overfit your your data. They just uh, grab train uh, put more data for training. That's how they combat this. So, so okay. your 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 question is right. Uh, the deeper the layer, you will be overfitting your existing data, mm. but you can increase your existing data too. Okay, so increase. I was saying is increase more data to sort of combat the overfitting, like even yeah. though you increase the the number of layers. Yeah. Okay. Um. Okay. I think last question really. Uh. So David, David is asking like, can you share a bit more to the, maybe to the audiences, right? When we talk about the training data set, how many uh, pictures are there? How many pictures for each class are there also? Uh, maybe you can share the, the, oh. a bit more of the data, yeah. Uh, I think uh, I might, uh, I might not remember the exact class of how many are on each class? But uh, for for me, the picture is around around sixty thousand. Sixty thousand picture. Sixty thousand. Uh, uh, roughly, okay. roughly, how many class? How many class? Oh, uh, for predicting? me, the the class the class uh, for me is uh, uh, because uh, this is an illustration project. I can I can decide on the classes. So uh, I I just pick a uh, uh, the the in the library in in the dictionary i picked uh, a thousand of them oh okay so a thousand thousand classes but 60 over thousand uh yeah. okay can okay i think uh, that's about it ready for today um so for the rest of you thank you uh, thank you very much for attending uh please thanks uh i would like to also thank zhang qi for uh speaking at our data science SG events thank you very much zhang qi Thank you and thank you, Joy, for arranging. <laughs> Thanks, cool. Okay, hey, thank you. Yeah, so unfortunately, uh, on a on a Zoom meetup, right, we, we can't clap to show our appreciation. Uh, but yeah, I I I'll just clap on behalf of the rest of the people. So thank you very much, Tati, for uh speaking. Um, uh, so thank for you. the rest, right, uh, thank you very much for oh yeah, David, yeah, you can actually put a clap on the reaction sign uh, on the reaction sign. Okay, thank you, Kama. Yes, thanks everyone. <laughs> okay, so uh, with that being said, right, uh, I think that's all ready for uh, today. Uh, do look up on our Facebook page uh, for the link uh, to the video. I think uh, Michael, Michael will share the link and uh, also do look out for our next uh, event in uh, November. Okay, so with that being said, thank you very much guys, thank guys and girls. Thank you for attending. Thank you. Bye-bye. Have a good night. Yep.